Uh, welcome. We'll go ahead and get started with the meeting of the Washington State Senate Law and Justice Committee for Tuesday, June 20th, uh, 2017. Uh, we have a number of our committee members here for the Senate Law and Justice Committee. We also have some guests who are here to uh, observe, Senator Palumbo from the uh, First District and uh, Representatives uh, Dolio and Dolan, both from the 22nd District here in Thurston County. Uh, I think their Senator Sam Hunt wished to be here, but he had a he had a conflict. So we're going to start. Uh, I, I'm going to have a brief opening statement, and then we're going to show a, a a brief clip from King Five TV, and then go ahead with uh, folks that are here for the uh, work session. The work session agenda uh, for today is to address campus security at the Evergreen State College. There are three questions. Primarily, the committee will explore with the invited witnesses what threats to the safety of students and faculty and staff have occurred uh, at Evergreen in recent weeks, what steps have the administration taken to ensure the safety of students, faculty, and staff, and uh, have those steps been effective, and three, what are the approximate costs to the state taxpayer uh, for these efforts? Although uh, Professor Weinstein had previously contacted our staff and agreed to testify. He subsequently uh, contacted us through his attorney and informed us that he would not be available for today's hearing. Although the issues at Evergreen and colleges generally are complex and involve matters of educational and employment policy and procedures and academic standards uh, that are probably best dealt with with other legislative committees, the focus of the hearing today is on public safety and is clearly within the scope of our Law and Justice Committee. I would request uh, to the extent possible that witnesses and members can find their remarks to um, issues related to, to public safety. I should note as well that this is a work session, not a uh, public hearing, and that only those who are invited by the chair to testify are permitted. Members of the public are welcome to watch the testimony, and I'm sure they will be uh, respectful of the witnesses and the committee. So um, if we could go ahead and uh, show that uh, clip from King 5 TV. This crowd, that's biology professor Brett Weinstein, whose class was taken over last month by a group of students from the Evergreen State College. I was immensely disappointed with the students who uh, obstructed his class. The president of the college, Dr. George Bridges, says the students responsible could be punished. Weinstein started holding classes at an Olympia Park after he was told he wasn't safe on campus. Students were upset and called for Weinstein's resignation because of past criticism of events and proposed policy changes regarding minorities at the college. Why the f is he here? The protest grew with President George Bridges becoming the next target of activists. Certainly when we were focusing on racism and free speech, uh, that activism took a turn that we didn't expect. It turned to uh, invective, to fear and some really intense emotion. Bridges says he was never fearful and was comfortable talking to students about racial issues, so he refused to have campus police get involved. But when word of the protest spread across the country and someone called in a threat saying they were going to execute people at Evergreen, Bridges shut down the school for three school days and then moved graduation off campus. We still get some, some uh, harassment and messages, and we want to ensure that everyone feels perfectly safe so that we can celebrate the accomplishments of our students. The president says protests are part of Evergreen history. He just hopes those in the future are more productive. How do we listen to each other? We have freedom of speech often, but are we listening to engage or are we listening to reject? And I fear that uh, here in some places and everywhere, we are, many are more willing to listen to reject than to understand. The president says the proposed policy changes that prompted all these protests are still being discussed and debated. He says the school wants to make sure that every student feels they are being treated fairly when they're on campus. And with all this exposure lately, a couple of lawmakers from the nearby state capitol have threatened to pull public funding for the school, at least submitted some legislation to do that. The pre president here tells us that he has spoken with lawmakers to assure them that this institution is delivering the education it's supposed to. Live on the campus of the Evergreen State College, Drew Mickelson, King 5 News. I would point out there are many other videos out there, uh, and we just uh, chose uh, 
uh, this this one is being maybe more appropriate for this audience than some of the others. Our, our first uh, invitee here is uh, Representative Manweller. If you could come forward and introduce yourself uh, for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Matt Manweller uh, from the 13th Legislative District, although I suspect that you have invited me to testify today more in my capacity as a college professor for the last uh, 19 years. Um, and it's, it's from that perspective that I was, thought I would accept your invitation and speak. Um, over the past few years, we've seen an uncomfortable increase in the amount of violence on college campuses, probably more so than at any other time since the Vietnam War. Uh, incidents at Middlebury, Yale, Berkeley, the University of Washington, and of course, Evergreen. Uh, these events have led many professors and students to ask, you know, why has this happened? Uh, what has changed in the last few years to lead to the increase in violence, and what are causing uh, these increased incidences? Um, I don't pretend to have any or all of the answers to those questions, but I am here, uh, Mr. Chairman, to share in my perspective uh, that I've garnered just simply from being in the university's classroom for the last few decades. <clears throat> so one, um, I don't believe that the students are learning this behavior in high schools. Uh, I haven't seen anything to suggest or indicate that high school teachers are teaching that violence is an acceptable response to ideas that one disagrees with. Um, I'm friends with many high school teachers. My wife is a teacher. I still visit many high school classrooms, so I don't think they're coming to colleges with this attitude. And if that's the case, then we need to assume that this is something that they may be learning uh, wall at the university or the college environment, and I think that that uh, should concern us. Two, uh, one insight that might be helpful to you in your committee as you discuss the notion of today's college students and the increasing use of violence is that today's college student, or many of them, I wouldn't want to paint with a broad brush, but many college students today think about language differently than we do or we did. We all remember the childhood phrase, I'm sure, <clears throat> sticks and stones will break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Uh, this was our generation and many generations before us, the ability to distinguish between verbal disagreement and physical disagreement, right? And it's the notion that we distinguish things that you say from the things that you do. And generally the attitude is we don't punish you for the things that you say, but we will punish you for physical violence, you know? And um, what I can tell you is that <clears throat> for many college students today that I work with, <clears throat> they don't make that distinction the way we used to. They see language and violence as the same thing. If they hear an idea that they disagree with, they will often respond with, you are doing violence to me and my community. Uh, if there is a speaker that they disagree with that comes to campus, they will say, you are making it unsafe for me to be here. Uh, they see verbal assaults in some of the same light that we see physical uh, assaults. And I think it's important for your discussion today because it may explain why you're seeing an increase in violence on college campuses. In the past, it was never acceptable to use violence against a speaker that you disagreed with. But if you see speech as violence, then of course, the use of violence to combat violence becomes more justified. Um, in talking with my younger millennial college students, they would liken it similar to what we would say in your committee as self-defense, right? Your committee, Law and Justice, says, there's a difference between you proactively going out and using violence and you responding to violence with violence of your own. One is a crime, one we consider self-defense. But for many of my college students, they say, well, if you say things that are offensive or hateful, then my use of violence is just violence to defend myself against other violence. And so I don't think people from my generation, maybe your generation, see it that way, but an increasing number of college students see violence, physical violence against what they consider verbal violence as therefore uh, justified. Um, and the third thing that I would say 
is that a lot of times the violence comes from zealotry. And as any student of history knows, that all zealot movements eventually get to become so enamored with the righteousness of their cause that they adopt this kind of the ends justify the means mentality. And that's nothing unique to this generation. Uh, many movements, if you look at, become captured by the zealot wing. And then, you know, uh, it becomes this notion that um, what we're doing is so important that there can be uh, collateral damage. Um, and if you are a college student and you firmly believe that you are saving the world from environmental catastrophe, if you are e uh, um, eliminating racial injustice, so if you are bringing about social justice, uh, then it, it might be a little worth a little violence or uh, something to bring about that cause. And it does kind of lead to this, well, the ends justify the means, and I think we see that. Uh, what I'll close with, and I know you have a lot of other people here, is that um, I'm not sure <clears throat> if laws can fix this problem. Uh, we don't really have a legal problem so much as we have a campus cultural problem. Um, it's already illegal to throw a brick at the head of a speaker that you disagree with. It's already illegal to break the arm of a professor uh, that brought a speaker to campus that you disagreed with. It's already illegal to burn buildings because you disagree with a speaker. And so I'm not sure if additional laws uh, will change uh, what is uh, what we're seeing on campus. Um, but what I think we can do is focus on creating incentives for administrators to alter the culture on campuses so that the environment is um, truly uh, a place where um, we do tolerance. And, and when I use the word tolerance, I, I mean the word in, in a tough sense. Uh, it's easy to advocate for tolerance if it means that you should only say things that I agree with. But true tough tolerance means that you have to listen to people that you disagree with. And um, we're not necessarily seeing that. Um, and it's not just Evergreen, uh, Senator Patton. There are lots of universities where we're having this problem. So I appreciate the fact that you've held this hearing today. All right. Well, there may be a few questions. I, I have one, uh, Representative. How, how do you feel then a college should balance the need to allow robust uh, debate with the physical safety of uh, faculty, students, and staff? Well, I think that they should adopt a uh, hold to a very long-held standard of the heckler's veto established in uh, Finer versus New York in 1951 that said that the heckler does not get to silence the speaker. And what, they, what the Supreme Court said in 1951 is that, that it is the police and the administration's job to silence the heckler to prevent the incitement of violence than to silence the speaker. And what we've seen on college campuses is uh, deference to the heckler. And we say, okay, this speaker is going to cause protests. This speaker is going to cause increased security risks. It's going to cause a heckler. So therefore, the speaker must be silent. And that really flips Finer versus New York on its head. Our role as the state is to defend free speech, not to allow the heckler to silence and uh, use the threat of violence to silence a speaker. Certainly, and sometimes there's more than one heckler, or there's uh, mm -hmm. apparently, and I'm sure we'll hear from Pro Professor Bridges and others at Evergreen, uh, but, you know, a professor that, that was not safe on campus and had to uh, teach his class off, off campus, uh, uh, on that, so you have a whole series of, of hecklers that seem to, to right. some extent, taken over part of the campus. What right? What and you know, I said, I close with, I said, maybe we could use as the state our financial incentives to encourage a more uh, conducive environment to public debate. And I think where that can happen is at student orientation. Uh, over the last 20 years, I've seen student orientations where we bring in freshmen and we try to teach them what does it mean to be a college student. And we spend a lot of time talking to them about racism and sexism and anti-Semitism and homophobia and being, you know, uh, trying to reduce their college footprint. But what we don't really teach them in college orientation is how to engage in debate anymore, how to engage the marketplace of ideas or what we call the agora. Uh, and I think that needs to be part of what that first week in college is in the dorms rather than just focusing on one side of the social justice aspect. All right, Senator Angel, you have a question? Thank you, Mr. Chair, yes. Um, thank you for being here, and I'd like to ask a question of you with regard to the fact that you have been a professor for a lot of years. 
Um, I am totally in support of respectful protest. However, when a student body takes, or a members of the student body, these students have taken over the administrative building, which happened in May at Evergreen, putting into safe, or actually harm's way, uh, they put students, faculty, staff, all at a point that it could have been very dangerous for them. Have you experienced this kind of thing in your past years here uh, in Washington State teaching? Uh, not to me personally, but we did have a similar incident uh, with my president uh, two years ago. Uh, he was called out on false pretenses to an event at the student union building, and when he got there, he was surrounded in a big circle by a group of students. And, uh, you know, they were far more respectful than what you saw in the videos in Evergreen, but it was intentionally intimidating and threatening. The whole idea was we're going to circle you, and you're not leaving here until we get what you want. Want from us. Uh, I think my president handled it as best he could, uh, but uh, that's one I've seen. Uh, a few years earlier, um, uh, there was a student group that brought in some speakers uh, that wanted to talk about immigration, and they were shouted down uh, not only by uh, other students, but by other staff members, and I felt that that didn't set a good example as a professor, uh, but more importantly, uh, by paid staffers who organized the debate uh, and the repression. And so I always felt that if you're paid by the university, you should probably be fostering the agora, not using taxpayer dollars to silence a speaker that you disagreed with. So I've seen it a few times, but nothing like what we're experiencing today. Any other questions, Senator Obam? I appreciated your, your description of sort of this, the, the blurring of the line between speech and between conduct. I think that's, um, let me think about that, but that seems um, really almost self-evident from what we viewed. Um, it strikes me too that maybe a variation on the same theme, and I appreciate your reaction to this. Uh, it, uh, an academic environment that permits uh, the kind of intolerance, the kind of verbal vicious attacks on certain viewpoints um, we'll have a very difficult time then in regulating uh, conduct that attacks uh, openly, uh, physically, uh, those viewpoints. If you don't, if you don't create the conditions for this robust debate that the First Amendment absolutely guarantees, and we just had the U.S. Supreme Court reiterate yep. that concept two days ago <laughs> yeah. unanimously, yeah. <laughs> I think that has direct application in the, in the academy. Um, but if you if you don't foster an environment which which creates that that ability to robustly debate co competing controversial viewpoints, it will be very difficult then to be able to say to you, to the heckler um, that you may not engage in conduct that will attack and undermine that viewpoint w with which you do not agree. Would you react to that? Yeah, I mean, you have to draw a fine line and that uh, protest is something that is a long cherished tradition, both in the United States, but particularly on college campuses. I mean, one of the great ironies is one of the first college protest movements at Berkeley was in favor of free speech. And, you know, sometimes the academy has kind of uh, flipped on its head here. Um, but I think that, you know, we don't have to really create new law much as we need to enforce the established, uh, you know, um, compromises that the Supreme Court has already fostered is that you have the right, you know, your the right to wave your hand ends at my nose, right? You can't, your exercise of your rights cannot be used to diminish my rights. So if I want to listen to a speaker or go to a speaker or express something, I have that right. They have the right to respond, but they don't have the right to respond to the point that I cannot make my point or to not speak at all or to feel safe. And I think that when you get to the point where a professor feels like they have to exit the campus in order to do what the state is paying them to do, which is to teach class. And uh, I think what's been lost in all of this uh, debate is the student who's paying tuition, right? We talk about the student's right to protest. We talk about the professor's right uh, to teach. We talk about the administration's responsibility to foster both. But we do have students that were paying tuition, and they're paying tuition to attend a class. And they're paying it to us, the state. And when they're they have to leave campus, um, then we're interfering with their rights uh, as, a, as a tuition payer. And that's kind of where I come from as the professor. I always felt my ultimate responsibility would be to the kids who are in my classroom. All right. Thank you very much. Any thank other you. questions? Thank you very much for Appreciate coming me. today. Next would be uh, Professor uh, Peros. <laughs> And 
if you could uh, just state your name for the record. Thank you. Mike Peros, thank you for inviting me. Uh, before I begin my statement, I just want to preface it with saying that I'm just representing myself, not the college, not the faculty. Um, and if the I would urge the committee to sort of talk to more faculty so that you can get some diverse viewpoints that might be different than mine. Right. And, and you're a faculty member at Evergreen. That's State. correct. And so I want to sort of give you an introduction a little bit by re um, reading an email that I sent to all faculty, an excerpt of it. Um, it'll give you some idea about um, my views and what's happened. And um, I, I just want to say that there might be some offensive words in there like hippie and redneck so I don't want I want to be sure that you're oh, the committee's okay with this I, I don't think Senator Peterson's ever heard those words okay before. so <laughs> yeah so um, this email was sent before um, sorry right after the protests and right after the campus closure I've been teaching evergreen students about biology agriculture and animals for the last 10 years before becoming a faculty member, I had a full-time large animal veterinary practice where I would spend my days traveling to farms in rural red counties of Western Washington. The Evergreen State College has had a local, local reputation as a hippie college ever since it was founded in the mid-1960s as an alternative to traditional universities. Interdisciplinary 16 credit programs are often taught by multiple professors and students receive written narrative assessments instead of grades. With a low student to faculty ratio of 25 to one, Evergreen professors have the opportunity to learn collaboratively with students through critical inquiry around interesting questions. My most rewarding teaching experiences have been when my mostly left-leaning students have prompted me to examine my own views on controversial issues. I would like to think that students have also benefited from being exposed to the occasional redneck perspective in the classroom and on field trips. Many of the farms we visited were my clients who always looked forward to the annual visits by Evergreen's strangely dressed students with piercings and tattoos that seemed to be much more inquisitive and insightful than their land-grant university counterparts. They were definitely awkward moments, but the result of these cross-cultural exchanges were always the same. Discussion and an appreciation for multiple perspectives that were previously unheard or misunderstood within their own prospective community. I believe that I had found the antidote to the ever-increasing disease of polarization and identity politics that have been dividing our rural and urban populations. Now Evergreen has taken from me the medicine needed to cure the illness. Even worse, the college is now contributing to the vilification, paranoia, and irrational rhetoric that fuels hatred and violence. The antidote has now become toxic. This is a story of how a Democrat voting veterinarian working with mostly Republican livestock owners became a bigoted professor at a left-wing progressive liberal arts college. It is about a collection of professors that are so blinded by their advocacy that they cannot fathom different viewpoints. It involves a newly appointed president who believes in ideological safe spaces who endorsed a strategic equity plan that will hurt the very students it is trying to help. Following student protests and controversy about the Day of Absence, Day of Presence, Evergreen administrators sent out ominous notices labeling free speech advocates and persons who simply do not agree with official campus opinion as potentially violent. It was a desperate move using fear tactics to rally the masses and prevent students from thinking clearly. That morning was the first time that I was actually nervous coming to campus, not because of threats of white supremacists, but because I was worried that someone on campus would think that I might be one of them. And then we got the alert on campus. I could see the fear in some of our students' faces as I helped escort a student of color to her dormitory. Then I decided to stay on campus for a while, and an administrator approached and asked, how did we get to this point? I guess safe spaces can be dangerous places. What I meant by this is that if we protect students from ideas that may upset them because they are different than their own, we also create fear of people who have different viewpoints, including the invasion of physical safe spaces. And these are the spaces that do need to be protected. In my opinion, the primary purpose of an education is to free students from narrow perspectives, limited thinking, and partisanship 
in order to obtain knowledge. In fact, one of the five foci of learning at Evergreen is learning across significant differences. Of course, these differences include race, gender, sexual orientation, ethnicity, religion, etc. But more importantly, students need to learn across ideological differences. When social justice is institutionalized in a manner that fundamental questions about justice, equity, diversity, sustainability, etc., are discouraged, then the institution cannot be inclusive nor educational. We are left with a campus population that is incapable of self-reflection, who reinforces their own beliefs at the expense of others. Once Evergreen implicitly adopts a particular vision and value system, then it, can take, then it takes away freedom of thought and decision-making from individuals that are members. At the end of each year, the college asks students to write an academic statement where they candidly reflect upon their shortcomings while discussing their future educational goals. In order for Evergreen to move forward from this, we have to do the same thing that we are asking of our students. This means taking responsibility and undergoing sincere self-examination. By refocusing our mission as a college that teaches students how to think rather than what to think, we, we can restore our reputation as a premier learning institution. All right, are there any uh, questions from committee members? Uh, Senator Obam. I just want to say well said. Yes, thank you. How, how do you personally feel? I mean, obviously school's out now, but how did you feel about your own personal safety during this time, the last few weeks? A safe, it depends on what you mean by safety. Pers like physical safety, I, I feel fine. I don't feel threatened at all. Um, safety about losing my job, also I'm not fearful of losing my job. Um, fearful of potentially having a class interrupted, possibly, but um, really there's, n I don't have any sort of fear of sort of physical safety. All right, thank you. Any other questions? If not, thank you. Senator Darnell. Oh, I'm sorry, Senator Darnell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Peros, uh, thank you for being here. I thank was you. able to read some of your comments online and uh, appreciate someone coming from this from the veterinary perspective of uh -huh. uh, behavior management uh, <laughs> that uh, uh, we may have some lessons to learn from you but uh, I, I wonder it, as you you mentioned that you weren't representing faculty but uh, surely as um, the faculty has had this um, ability to send out thoughts uh, comments uh, through an email system that exists on campus. I wonder if there are colleagues of yours who may have been through uh, my formative years. Uh, uh, 50 years ago, I graduated from high school, and so it was well in the, uh, the years of, of a lot of student protest, a lot of acrimony and anxiety and even threats of violence and sometimes actual violence, physical violence, uh, which is different from voicing uh, your concerns about something, but it, from the perspective of being a faculty or staff member, is is there something to be learned from the past? Do you see something different about what Evergreen is facing or has faced in the last couple of weeks? D um, different in what way? Sorry. I'm well, uh, different in the sense that that um, campuses go through these kinds of experiences, uh, and that uh, uh, contrary to the f previous speaker, I don't think that we. Uh, learn something in high school and then learn something else in college, but I think there's an evolution of uh, maturity and an evolution of sort of awareness about about a voice, you know, and what a voice can accomplish and exchanging, yeah, I mean, I mean, exchanging I differences of opinions happens more in colleges than it was able to happen in high school, but um, do you have any thoughts on, on sort of how this experience is different from what has happened in the past? culturally in our community. Yeah, country. well, I don't think I can comment much on that. I, I think I agree with Professor Manweller in that. Um, it's important to, it is important to teach students, whether they're in high school or in college, to sort of engage in this sort of civil discourse and have a, create a, a campus culture where sort of free inquiry is is paramount. That's, that's important. And so, um, I don't think that automatically happens. I think that we we do 
Evergreen, I think we're, we're, we can be positioned to do this if we make this sort of a priority. Uh, Senator Angel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for being here with us today. I think it, it's really helpful to get professors' uh, feelings on a lot of this. However, I want to share with you, I have gotten some emails anonymously, and one of them says, I'm faculty at the Evergreen State College, and I have spoken out all anonymously as I do not feel safe speaking out. And I wanted, are you hearing from the other faculty that they are fearful of speaking out, possibly because of losing jobs or other retaliation? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I, I was a veterinarian. I was a, in a I was, tough spot. I was but. a veterinarian before I was a professor, so professors really have the most secure job on earth if you have tenure. I mean, it's it's pretty pretty amazing. So I'm not sure if the fear of losing a tenured position is, is key. I think the question is, I don't know, I have no way of knowing how many faculty, staff, or students, and students are the most important ones here, um, are uh, sort of participating in self-censorship. In other words, are they afraid or whether, and I just have no way of knowing that. There's very few students and um, faculty have spoken up about these issues in this particular manner, but so there may be a number of them that are afraid to speak, but mostly just out of, I would say, being shunned by their peers more than anything else. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Uh, we'll now uh, ask President Bridges to come forward. And I guess there's a panel, if you'd like yes. to have the whole panel come, which sure. is uh, Colleen uh, Russ, the Go Government Affairs Representative for Evergreen, and uh, Stacy Brown, who heads up the uh, Evergreen uh, Police Department. Go ahead. I understand you have a statement. You'd Senator like Patterson, yes, yeah. thank you for this opportunity, committee members. I appreciate the chance. This is on my right, uh, Chief Stacy Brown, who heads up Evergreen Police Services, and Colleen Rust, our Director of Government Relations. As a matter of introduction, my name is George Bridges, and I am the President of Evergreen State College. I'm a native Washingtonian uh, and has served in higher education here in the state since 1982. I served 23 years as a faculty member at the University of Washington and a dean there, 10 years as the president of Whitman College in Walla Walla, and now the president of Evergreen. I've devoted 35 years of my life to working with college students. They are my career. They are my professional life. Evergreen is traditionally a very safe campus. Today we will discuss campus safety in the context of the past three weeks. I will describe how the campus has responded to those events and actions we are taking to improve campus safety uh, while continuing our mission of teaching and learning. As part of the materials you've been given is a timeline of the events on campus. It begins with our annual discussion called Day of Absence, Day of Presence. Since the 1970s, some students, faculty, and staff of color have chosen to voluntarily leave campus for a day-long retreat. <coughs> This year, the coordinating committee decided to change the approach and extend the option to people who identify as white. Participation was, and as it always has been, completely voluntary. About 200 people out of 4,800 people on campus chose to participate this year. The great majority of students, faculty, and staff um, decided to stay on campus attending class as usual. But as we've heard, and you know, Evergreen has always been a place that takes on difficult issues, sometimes in a rather raucous fashion. This year, the mischaracterization of our day of absence, day of presence, against a backdrop of national tension over many issues, including racism and free speech, produced a level of fear and anger and invective that uh, we've witnessed here and that we've never seen at Evergreen before, to my knowledge. That tension was on view when a group of students interrupted Evergreen faculty member Brett Weinstein's class on May 23rd. Later that day, I was engaged by more than 100 students who expressed anger about Brett's views and other experiences at the college. Obviously, we've seen a video of some of the discussions. They were heated. Having been in situations like this before on other campuses, I made a strategic decision 
right there and then in meetings. My decision was to de-escalate the, the conflict. I used the same approach on the afternoon, May 24th, when a group of students occupied my office. And when law enforcement and our police services unit asked whether I wanted them to intervene, I declined. Intervention in those settings by law enforcement, from my perspective and my experience, sir, would have escalated the conflict and possibly resulted in injuries and property damage to, to people. And by the end of the day, we had a working plan to review the issues that students were raising. And more importantly, uh, our students, staff, faculty, and law enforcement resamed, remained safe that, those days. On Friday, May 26, we had a meeting to acknowledge and address the students' concerns. I refused to grant some of their requests, one of which was to fire Brett Weinstein. My response was direct, we do not and will not fire people on request. Many of the other concerns that students uh, raised were the object of work already underway by staff and faculty. The evening, that evening, May 26, ended positively and peacefully. And here's where the turn changes for me personally and for the college, I believe. The next day, Twitter feeds, social media, and cable news blew up with misinformation about the college, the protests, our day of absence, and day of presence. We were hit with a flood of hateful harassment that was targeted at students and the Washington State employees who make up our staff and faculty. That included the most graphic threats imaginable against specific individuals and family members. Anxiety on campus rose, as you might imagine. Threats of criminal violence to Evergreen from outside the college followed. At the recommendation of law enforcement, and it was at that recommendation, we suspended operations at the college in response to specific threats. Our team in police services, the Washington State Patrol, and the FBI collaborated in investigating the threats. And as a consequence, we added State Patrol troopers to enhance campus security immediately. In the aftermath of protests and de-escalation, a few students have been accused of aggression, and there have been reports of vandalism on campus. These cases are being investigated now and will be subject either to criminal prosecution or adjudication through our student conduct code. Either way, we expect to complete the initial adjudication or disposition of these cases by the end of July. <clears throat> Freedom of speech belongs to everyone. Freedom to threaten people does not. The language some students used during these events was offensive by any standard. And the way they spoke to faculty and staff conveyed immense disrespect. That they disrupted Brett's Weinstein class, wet Brett Weinstein's class is unacceptable. We expect more from Evergreen students and I am personally and we all are disappointed by those who chose to engage in this manner. We are sending each individual student who we can identify from video footage of the protest at Brett Weinstein's classroom a letter of notification and warning, and the warning will be quite clear. If they repeat this type of disruption in the future, they will be adjudicated under our conduct code. On June 15th, Evergreen's tradition of freedom of speech was on display when the Patriot Prayer Group demonstrated on campus. They did attract a counter demonstration through tremendous preparation work by the Evergreen Police Services and with essential help of the State Patrol's rapid deployment force of 70 troopers. The groups engaged one another with, without significant injury and no damage to college property. The next day, Friday, we celebrated Evergreen's 46th commencement at Cheney Stadium in Tacoma. The stadium provided 20 additional law enforcement officers from the Tacoma Police Department in addition to stadium security. Our graduates, their friends, their families were able to celebrate their achievement in a secure setting without fear. The campus is quiet now, as you might imagine. We have finished the school year and are turning toward our future as a college community, as a catalyst for businesses and jobs and prosperity in the region, and as an integral part of the state's higher education system. The question that we face is this, how do we change and adapt to thrive in this era of what I would describe as national polarization? I am talking with Evergreen faculty, students, alumni, legislators, and others about how we can strengthen and clarify our values and the rules of conduct of students, staff, and faculty. We cannot rely 
on the lean public safety presence that has been the tradition at our college. The safety of all students, faculty, and staff must be paramount if we are to succeed at our core job. That is teaching and learning, just as Representative Manweller and Professor Perros has said. Our hardworking law enforcement officers need the training, equipment, and staffing levels necessary to ensure their continued ability to protect all of our 1,000 acre campus. I will be seeking help from the legislature to meet the challenges of campus safety that we have. Finally, we ourselves must change. We must listen to each other to understand, not to reject or repudiate. It is not just freedom of speech, it is listening to one another to understand different points of view. We also need a diversity of people, attitudes, orientations, politics, and views on campus. The problems of racism and inequity that we dealt with this year, this year are real and must be discussed in a campus environment that offers security for all. I believe that at the heart of Evergreen's future is a model, a successful model of education copied by all colleges around the nation. We serve a large number of Washington's veterans, community college transfer students, non-traditional students, and those who are first in their family to attend college. I believe that the achievement of our graduates is proof that the model works. As business leaders, Oscar-winning filmmakers, members of Congress, scientists, physicians, artists, entrepreneurs, and public servants, they make their mark in Washington and across the country. So thank you for your invitation to speak today. Thank you for your ideas. I view collaborating with the legislature as absolutely essential to our future. All right, and uh, Ms. Rest, I didn't know if you wanted uh, to have the presentation by um, others there on the panel or, or um, if we maybe could ask questions of uh, the president at this time. Absolutely, we're available for question. All right. Um, well, you, you've mentioned a couple times where you had to make uh, decisions uh, regarding law enforcement, both on campus, uh, both with the State Patrol and uh, I believe other law enforcement agencies. Do you have any background in law enforcement yourself that helps you make those decisions? I do not, I am not trained as a law enforcement officer. I'm trained as an educator. Most of my scholarly work and research focuses on the courts and the legal system and law enforcement and how they respond to racial minorities. All right. How, how do you go about making those uh, decisions? I mean, how did you decide initially not to call in your local law enforcement uh, when there were some problems on campus and then later uh, have to engage the state patrol uh, with more complete and vigorous uh, law enforcement presence on campus? Thank you, thank you, that's a good question. Thank you, Senator. Um, I made my decisions based on multiple instances in which I've been in the same situations on different campuses in which I've worked with students for 35 years. One faces one of three choices in those situations when you're surrounded by students like um, President Godino was at Central and other presidents are across the country. You can choose to engage law enforcement to break up the students, you can exit, or you can choose to engage the students and listen. Those are really the choices you have. Uh, the choice I made was strategic. I was very concerned, particularly when they were surrounding me and surrounding our administrators and in my office, that if law enforcement were to come in, that there would be perhaps violence, perhaps damage to property, damage to the students. I felt perfectly safe in that environment. I feel perfectly safe with college students. I didn't like the way they spoke with me, sir, but I felt safe. Could you have left? Could you have left? I believe I could have, yes, sir. All right, um, yeah, some of the videos maybe would call that in question, but you felt you could have left and left safely and there wouldn't have been any consequences? You know, being in the room, I felt comfortable. I knew the students and um, I felt as though I could leave. Yes, sir. All right. Um, and Cinder Angel has a question. Please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And first of all, uh, Colleen, I want to thank you. We've been emailing back and forth, and you have been extremely responsive in addressing my concerns, which have been uh, the lack of disciplinary action. Uh, you stated in your uh, statement that you have an investigation uh, is now underway, and I'd like to know by whom 
the investigation, who's doing the investigation, and then if it does come to criminal prosecution or handling through a student code, con, uh, conduct of code, mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to know who establishes the code and um, how it is established, how it's enforced. I don't know much about that code, but if that's going to be part of the um, disciplinary action, I'd like to know more about it. So if you can tell me, first of all, the investigation is being handled by whom, who is overseeing that, and second of all, how the student conduct code works. Good questions. Thank, Thank you. you. The investigations, uh, particularly if there are allegations of criminal conduct are being done, undertaken by um, our police services unit. These are commissioned law enforcement officers that work at Evergreen on a full-time basis. They are also the people who provide security for the campus. Um, recognizing the threats that we had, we chose particularly the external threats we called in, also the state patrol, as I mentioned. So uh, it, it would be done by commissioned law enforcement officers that work at the college. And um, the conduct code is something that is established uh, under the Administrative Procedures Act. It is part of the WAC, uh, Washington Administrative Codes. Every college has a, um, an administrative code established in under the Administrative Procedures Act that is informed by the work of the Attorney General, our staff, and we have a student conduct staff that oversees and, and, a, and administers that code. It's a very extensive document, and it is a fairly lengthy process that involves protecting the rights of those alleged to have committed conduct code violations and requires an investigation by our student conduct staff. So we have staff dedicated to that purpose. Uh, Senator Olbian. <clears throat> Thank you, President, for appearing before the committee. I, I want to uh, explore this connection between uh, intolerance towards certain viewpoints and its connection then to um, uh, violent conduct uh, targeted at that those viewpoints. Mm -hmm. um, I've read Professor uh, Weinstein's letter. I assume you've read that the letter. Do you find anything in there uh, in the way he's expressed his viewpoint? Uh, to be um, beyond the pale or extremely objectionable or uh, showing intolerance? You know, that's a, that's a fair question. Um, in my initial reading of it, I did not, but um, I believe that there are those on campus who did. Okay, and I read it too. I, I can't see an intolerant word. Uh, I, I see the professor standing up for liberal small L, uh, the tradition of ex wanting to create an environment where competing viewpoints can be exchanged and debated um, passionately, uh, but still show respect uh, for those viewpoints. I think he's, he's expressed himself in that best tradition. Wouldn't you agree? I would, I would however, I would say that there have been more than one, one communication. There was a there's a fairly intense exchange that went over multiple communications, and um, I think the area that is of greatest concern to me is a mischaracterization of our day of absence, day of presence, that occurred subsequently uh, on cable news and on other situations in other contexts. That is what produced a lot of the tension, the fear, the anxiety that came from external sources. Let me just follow up one more question about, sure. about the concern about a, an environment of intolerance that from the outside looking in, and I don't have the, the insider information you'd have, so I, I, I'm willing to uh, accept that I my perception may be uh, limited. But um, um, but it concerned me that that Everything that I've read from the professor, from Professor Weinstein, and, and I've, I've seen a couple of interviews of him, just his demeanor. Uh, in fact, he's, he's no conservative. <laughs> um, uh, and then to have 50, I believe it's 50 of his colleagues uh, file a complaint against him. I, I, th what concerns me, i like to s get your reaction, what concerns me about that is that to me that perpetuates the notion that there are certain views that are uh, it, that, sh that should not be tolerated. That even that the faculty itself is is filing a complaint against this professor for expressing, uh, albeit a controversial uh, viewpoint, that I think was frankly fairly reasonable. What, what's your reaction to that, Senator? My m fair fair question. So my sense was that the reaction on the part of faculty, which I did not encourage, and. <clears throat> 
was not to his original expression, but it was to uh, working through media to communicate information about um, the college. I think that was their objection. I could be corrected on that. But I think they were concerned that, as some of us were, that as um, announcements were made on the media about the college, there were misrepresentations of what had happened and what who we were. And let me just finish. To which, to which he was responsible, you think, for, for those mis misperceptions in the media? I, I'd, I'd be really reluctant to make a commitment on that, to make a statement on that. I don't think that's appropriate. But I think the concern was there was an onslaught of messages that came from sources with no connection to the college across the country, anonymous and very venomous statements. Fair enough, but why would you attribute those to, to Professor Weinstein and, be, and, and, and have that be um, a, a, a reason for him to be complained against by his faculty? I don't I, understand I, that connection. I didn't attribute it to him. I, I believe some of the faculty did. Okay. Is uh, prof the Professor Weinstein under investigation now? No. All right. And there were reports of a lot of damage uh, done to campus buildings from smash windows and other things. Can you confirm whether or not the damage occurred and whether that's part of the investigation that's ongoing? It is part of the investigation. There was damage that occurred, and I believe the valuation of the damage was um, $5,000. Okay. There was also reports and even some videos of students carrying baseball bats around campus. Did, did that occur to your knowledge? Um, my understanding is that's being investigated as a criminal act by our police services unit. All right. Um, Oh, yes, Senator Darnell. Thank you again, Mr. Chair. Um, President, Mr. President, um, I fully agree and understand your decision making about what your limitations or your, your SWOT analysis, what were the strengths and weaknesses and opportunities and certainly the threats as students came into your office. And I understand that um, your decision to not invoke uh, your ability to call in campus police or other other kind of uh, supportive law enforcement. I want to go back to something you said initially about the day when the debate changed uh, and the and the out uh, the outside sources mm -hmm. created a change in that sense of safety on campus. And I wonder if you can postulate about what your response would have been had one of those protest groups from outside mm -hmm. come into your office with the same intent to talk with you about change on the campus with the same uh, intensity, the same voices, the same uh, anger, the same profanity, the same uh, you know, intention, uh, demands, let's say, of change on the campus. And, and I wonder if you can, you know, further talk about sort of that role of uh, being a, uh, a knowledgeable and interactive college president who does know students on the campus to, uh, you know, this bigger issue now because of social media and other kinds of organizations being developed around the country with very different views on how to solve problems. Um, how you as a college president can actually assure that kind of safety, either for yourself in this case or for others on campus? Those are two tough questions. Good questions. Thank you. Well, uh, had I know college students. I don't know other groups. I've worked tirelessly for many years with college students, classes of 800 where a quarter or a third of the class didn't like the grades they were getting. That's an interesting experience. So I feel very comfortable with college students in even in tense interactions when the language is just plain rude. I don't like it. I don't like the disrespect. And I've talked to the protest leaders very firmly in private conversations about that. But if it's an outside group, I would be much more inclined to call in law enforcement right away. Again, my decisions were based on years of work with students in many different contexts, many different experiences, many different settings. 
And I would have, I would feel quite uncomfortable, if not unsafe, if strangers came in and did the same thing. And back to, well, to your comment about social media and to Senator O'Ban's comment earlier, social media has just complicated the work of everyone in some respects. I suspect you get a few email messages. <clears throat> And how does one anticipate the impact that social media, Twitter, all of those that are accessible to everyone instantaneously, that uh, is a real problem. And one of the reasons that I think contributed Senator Ban to the um, onslaught was the fact that there are video recordings of everything going on that went right up on the web so that everyone could see inside my office with students screaming. Um, I wish I could have reversed that. I wish I could have prevented that. Um, and I'm thinking and talking, I talked with the other college presidents here at the university, here, uh, the other public college presidents, university presidents, just yesterday about that very issue. How do we, how do we have private conversations with groups of students? And it's very hard. Um, if there are ideas or suggestions you have, believe me, I welcome them. Um, that is another complicating factor, and that will cause me, no doubt, to be much more cautious in the future. Whether I bring in law enforcement really depends on whether I'm dealing with students, students who I know, who I care about, who I understand, or strangers. <clears throat> that will be a factor. Um, if I answered your question... So I guess I have one suggestion. Please. Because you asked for one. Um, May 4th, 1970, four students were killed at Kent State yeah. during the Vietnam War. Um, I was asked to join a student group that met daily with President Flores up at Western Washington, then State College, um, to try to address uh, how, do we, how do we engage students, how do we talk about safety, how do we, in this case, law enforcement was brought on campus and it was law enforcement that right. committed the murders. So in that situation, it was a little bit different. It wasn't outside in agitators that were coming potentially with guns as you uh, were faced with that prospect last week. Um, but it was one where there was massive unrest on the campus and a lot of fear about uh, what if it could happen at Kent State, what could happen here. And so I, I wonder if, uh, if you, it's a terrible time of year um, because now the students are gone, uh, or most of them are. But, but I wonder as you have this time between now and the start of the next term, if, if you would build some sort of a process like that mm -hmm. to really uh, give the students a voice, a broad range of students uh, uh, a voice and uh, we had SDS on campus. We had, uh, you know, I was working in the dorms. I mean, it was really a broad, very diverse group of people that came together daily with the president. So thank you. Mm -hmm. That is part of one of those. That is an item that I'm considering. We're also considering uh, <clears throat> an external study of the college and how we move forward from this event uh, without people from outside the, the, the college to take a look and with a fresh set of eyes about what could we do differently? How could we support our students, faculty, and staff? And what can we do to increase um, and improve the success of our students and ensure that we have adequate safety measures? We've invested a huge amount of time in safety since in this whole set of is issues, and um, we need to do more. Well, speaking of public safety, one of the issues that the students brought up, one of the concerns people have had is whether or not your local police force is able to be armed on campus as a public safety measure to protect students, faculty, and, and staff, to protect somebody from an active shooter or something that unfortunately has happened in other campuses around the country. Uh, what position did you take on that? And then later, of course, you paid the state patrol to come in who are presumably all armed. Uh, what is the status of that? I'd like to, I'll address it briefly and then I'll let our chief speak. She's, I'm losing my voice. <laughs> um, our officers are armed. 
um, but they do need additional training and equipment and um, additional support. Uh, frankly, um, sir, we, we, uh, we are a leanly staffed organization. The college has made some decisions historically that has invested resources in academic programs and supports and less resources in our police services unit. That needs to change. So with that, I'd be happy to introduce um, our Go chief ahead. and she can speak as well. Go ahead, chief. You're asking, can you repeat the question? So well, that was really about your ability to, to be armed on campus to provide for public safety for the faculty, students, and staff to any, any threats or harm that may come to them. Thank you, sir. Yes, we do have um, handguns. We do not have rifles. Uh, we are the only um, university in the state university that does not have rifles for active shooter situations. Um, but we are armed. We have additional law enforcement. We do. Uh, Senator Old Man, I just that comment invited a I think response. So, do, is it a funding issue? You don't have uh, rifles, or you've it's some sort of a philosophical reason you don't have them? It's uh, philosophical. Does it concern you though that if you had an active shooter, that that might be a necessary? And I don't know law enforcement and the importance of having rifles, but I'm just it concerns asking. me greatly. We should have rifles, in my opinion. Oh, okay. So that whose decision was it not to have rifles? It wasn't, it wasn't you, it wasn't your department. It's not me. Do you know who it is, whose decision that was? The college administration. Can I ask uh, President Bridges something? Please. You want to respond to that, President? Well, there's been a lot, this issue has been with uh, Evergreen for many years. Um, I'm here, this is my 19th month, I think. We're looking at that issue and uh, there are many needs that our units, that our police services units has. Uh, certainly they are seeking this. So you mentioned earlier you don't have any deep, deep experience in law enforcement. No, sir. And so you would want to defer to those who have that experience, whose, whose main job it is to keep the, the campus safe, wouldn't you? We are in conversation about you, that very issue. Okay, and you've got a chief right next to you who just said publicly, you need to have rifles, for, particularly after shooters. It seems to me you've got your answer on what I, you I, do. I heard her, sir. <laughs> All right, any other questions? Uh, I mean, do you have one, one question? One question for the hearing? <laughs> Senator Palumbo. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I appreciate you indulging me a question and thank you for inviting me today. I'm obviously very interested from a higher ed perspective. Um, uh, Mr. President, I saw somewhere, I think it was in a Times article, you had mentioned about the student conduct codes for the students who were protesting and exercising their free speech but disrupted the education of other paying customers in your you. university. Um, I think you had mentioned that you had trouble, like there was something that was blocking you from enforcing student conduct codes. Is there a role at the state level that we need to play to empower you to take whatever your local, you know, agreed upon sanctions are against a student who disrupts another student's learning? We are in the middle, thank you. Uh, we are in the middle of revising our conduct code and uh, staffing it in new ways. I believe that those measures that we take will enable us to address some of the issues that came up uh, in this instance that really make it quite difficult at this juncture to impose uh, impose conduct measures against uh, the, those protesters. And, and also, there's a difficult balance here. Um, disrupting classes is one thing, but being actively engaged in a protest, free speech is another. And I'm learning enough about the college and about how we handle these situations. I mean, we must revise our code. We must staff it appropriately. And that's something that we are have underway and have been working on this year. The fine line between what at Evergreen is an appropriate uh, protest and what is an inappropriate protest, clearly disrupting classes is inappropriate and will constitute, in, and I will send a warning to those students involved. Can't happen again. I have a question for Chief Brown. What, what exactly did you do during the time of these protests and your other uh, people that work for you? Um, well, there were several days involved and there were different actions on each day. Um, the first day, uh, myself and the other officer that was on duty that day responded to the area of uh, Professor Weinstein's class um, in an effort to um, ascertain his safety. Um, we were blocked by the students and so that it was an evolving situation. Um, and then and then the next day, um, we had made plans with local law enforcement, um, knowing in advance that this was um, most likely going to happen because of the flyers on campus. 
and um, had a plan in place and activated the emergency operations center, which was staffed by um, college employees. Um, and so we were basically in a standby mode. Um, and I was in conversation with uh, President Bridges and other administrators uh, throughout that first day um, protests. And then uh, the next day, um, it was the same thing where um, I spoke with other law enforcement leaders in the area and we came up with a plan of action um, because that day it was believed that the protest would be directed directly at the uh, police services uh, and employees there. So we had an emergency operations center at a claim fire department that day. Right. Okay. Thank you. And then maybe at least the last question for me, uh, President, uh, you indicated the graduation was up in uh, Tacoma at the great baseball stadium they have up there. Uh, and uh, I read in the paper, I don't know if it's accurate, some things are that I read in the paper, some aren't, but it, it cost $100,000. And if that's correct, where did that money come from? And also, I know you've had to uh, pay for the uh, state patrol, and you have a estimate of the cost of, of that at this point. Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. sir. Good. Yes, it was $100,000, and I think that was attributable to the fact that we had 20 Tacoma police officers there as part of the package, if you will. Um, and the uh, cost of the state patrol is $67,000, um, and that uh, for the time that we have them, uh, we're reviewing whether we continue to use that uh, group or not. Uh, there's some pros and cons. Love the state patrol. But we, we need to figure out our own needs. Um, the money is coming from reserves that we have, the college reserves uh, that uh, we've kept and uh, built over many years. So that's the, that's those are the funds that we're using. And the uh, uh, Thurston County Sheriff also has provided some help. Is that correct? Every law enforcement agency in um, in Thurston County, State Patrol has been very helpful. These are great allies. And, and is your cost of them, or they have a mutual aid uh, pact with you? I, I believe it's a mutual aid path, but do you want to mention that? The first day that they responded was overtime. Um, the main event uh, on June 15th with the Patriot Prayer coming in, that was mutual aid. With the State Patrol? With their the State the Patrol and Thurston County. So they... they 70, they had 70, as I believe you said, 70 yes, troopers there, and, and that was all mutual aid, so that saved uh, you folks a lot of money, but it's Cost the overtime that the state had to pay, and obviously the counties and cities, if they provide any help, had to uh, cover that, and then what, in turn, you're supposed to help them on occasion, or how does that work? Yes, sir, mutual aid is just that. When we call each other, we help each other. All right, uh, Cinder Oban. Question, uh, Chief. Um, uh, we heard from from President Bridges. He made a, a, a judgment call not to call in law enforcement, um, and I and I respect that. I under, understand his reasoning behind that. Uh, so, aside from that particular incident he was describing, where he made that de that decision that he considered might escalate the situation. Um, apart from that, do you do you uh, believe there have been times where you have been hampered? whether it's from administration or for, from some other source in, in carrying out what you thought would be you know, good police work over the la these last several days um, in protecting the campus, protecting staff and, and students anyway? I believe that campus law enforcement is very nuanced. Um, I come from the sheriff's office where I was there for 21 years. We handled things much differently. Um, in the last nine months, I've learned that uh, in higher ed, things are handled differently. Uh, would I personally have handled things um, differently than a college president? Yes, probably. Um, however, I don't have that experience in higher ed either um, that the president does. Um, I think it definitely operates different than it would if it was under um, an independent you know, police department. Um, I think some decisions would be different uh, based on law enforcement versus higher ed. Yeah, that's, that's fair. Uh, Senator Angel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a clarification here, because I too read probably the same article you did. Um, 
Chair Padden, about uh, the $100,000 to rent Cheney Stadium due to safety issues and that they had to go through metal detectors and that kind of thing. But did that $100,000, was that just to rent the stadium or was that inclusive with law enforcement costs? It was inclusive. Or, okay, so that included all the law enforcement costs plus Secure. the rental. Plus the rental security and the metal detectors. Uh, it was very well staffed. It was an impressive experience. Mm -hmm. So it was inclusive. And where did you come up with that kind of money? <laughs> well, we used, these are institutional reserves. The college has institutional reserves that we, uh, we maintain for rainy days, if you will. This was not a rainy day, but it was a, a, an issue that we had to address. And I can't, I can get back to you on the specific source if you'd like. I don't know the specific source of which reserves and how they were created. I can get I that. would appreciate that. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. But obviously that was a really big uh, decision. I'm sure it's probably the first graduation held away from, from campus. And uh, I, I'm sure there was some consternation. I'm sure it wasn't a decision you made lightly. Later, we heard a report that this uh, threat that was called in was not a credible threat. Now, I don't know if that's uh, the report you folks heard or, or not, and I don't know the timing of all this. Uh, was that a factor? Was this a close call on moving and incurring that cost or not? The first threat that called in, that was called in, we have no reason not to believe it was credible. Um, we believe the caller was from out of the area, but it, there is an active investigation going on that the FBI is heading. So we had no reason to believe that's not credible, and we still do not have that belief. At this point, it's still being investigated, and the person's, um, they're attempting to locate the person. Were there other threats that were deemed not credible or not? Um, there were other threats that we were we couldn't confirm or validate um, that were investigated. The FBI helped with that as well. Um, there were several that came in, um, and we just had to to investigate each as best as we could and, and make the best decision we could for that time. All right. So, President Bridges, was that threat then the major factor that caused you to move to graduation? Yes, sir. Yes, it was the threat. It was the fear that those threats induced among our staff, faculty, and students. And it was a judgment call at the last minute. We had eight days. We were eight or nine days out from commencement, and we had this, what we perceived as a standing threat, and uh, it was about safety. All right. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you all very much. Uh, I don't know if Chief Batiste is uh, present. There he is. Uh, Good afternoon, Chief. Good to see you again. You're good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Members of the committee, it's good to be before you. I'm here to answer any questions that you may have in relation to our engagement with our activities on the Evergreen College campus as of, as of late. All right. Um, and you, you had, uh, maybe you could tell us how many troopers or sergeants or how many folks you've, you've had, if you're currently continuing that, and what the what the cost has been, how, how all this came about. Yes, I'll track back to uh, May 23rd. We were notified of uh, disturbing activities on the campus of Evergreen College that brought that were brought to my attention. Uh, Chief Brown from the college called on the 29th of May and asked for assistance, so we provided mutual aid assistance at her request. After getting on campus and assessing the situation, uh, we put together a plan that would provide a total of eight troopers and two sergeants uh, from 7 a.m. until 7, uh, from 7 a.m. until uh, 3 a.m. at night. And then from there, we were made uh, aware of a protest plan on the campus uh, for June 15th. So we start to put together plans, and uh, with those plans came a need to bring to the campus for the June uh, 15th uh, protest a total of 80 troopers. Throughout the event, we had a total of 130 troopers, and on the 15th, up to myself and two of my assistant chiefs were also present on the campus to ensure that things uh, were orderly conducted. And some of this was part of a mutual aid, and some of it was at the request of Evergreen that they presumably are going to reimburse uh, the state for? Or? Yeah, to my, it's all, all, to my understanding, at the request of the, uh, of the college. So we have a total of approximately 135000 that uh, we've expended. Uh, to the tune of just over 2,000 hours committed to the activities on the campus. And 
You'll be submitting a statement to them for that? Then? We actually have a contract with them, yes. All right, all right. Um, could, you, could you tell us how, how it went? It, it appeared that your troopers uh, uh, were, were very important to maintaining uh, public safety and order. I, I heard there was one uh, arrest. That's correct. The, uh, maybe you could tell us. Some we made one arrest for disorderly conduct uh, with the assistance of the uh, Thurston County Sheriff's Department and other local agencies, help from the FBI, the Seattle Police Department, uh, and my troopers, uh, we were able to uh, ensure peace and order on the campus, in particular on June uh, 15th. So things went well uh, in perspective. All right, and any, any comments on the rest of the time that you've provided <laughs> services uh, up at Evergreen? Is it, are, are you, is it over, or are you still? Uh, well, we're with them through the day, uh, but for the most part, yes, it's over. Thankfully. Yes, yeah. Well, thank, thank you for your service. I, I didn't realize the cost was uh, quite that, that high, but uh, uh, obviously the, the safety of the students, the faculty, the staff, and, and, and the protesters. I mean, I guess all that is, is, is certainly very important. Are there any other uh, uh, questions of the uh, uh, chief? Um, yes, uh, Senator Angel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Where in the heck do you come up with all these extra troopers when I know you're already shorthanded? Well, trust me, they're not extras. <laughs> That's what I mean. Yeah, it's a matter of pulling them from you're the field them. and other assigned responsibilities. Okay. So this That's is my I... rapid deployment force, which are actually troopers on the front line. That's what I thought. Yes. Thank you. All right. Anything else you would like to add, Chief? No, thank you very much for the opportunity right. to come Any before you questions? again. Thank you. Thank you yeah. very much. Uh, Dave uh, Pearsall, the Thurston County Sheriff's Office. Hi, did you have any uh, statement you wish to make or were you just uh, here to answer questions? Well, primarily just here to answer questions, but um, have, after having heard some of the testimony, I would like to uh, go, go talk ahead. about a couple go of ahead. things. Um, I know we heard early on that uh, some of what's going on out at, at Evergreen is, is a culture. And I'd like to talk to an incident that we haven't heard about that happened in January when uh, Chief Brown was being sworn in as the police chief. Um, she had invited some friends and uh, friends and family, as well as faculty, uh, to attend watching her be sworn in. And when the uh, time came to for the actual ceremony, um, several students, I think there's probably 20 or 30 students there, decided that they were going to get up in front and take over the, the uh, entire event with uh, noisemakers and, and drums and horns and, and the PA. And they actually went and took the, one of the microphones out of, I believe it was a vice president's hand, just jerked it out of her hand. And they basically, uh, they were cursing, saying all kinds of things that just went on and on. It was, uh, complete chaos. Um, it got to the point where after about 15 minutes where uh, President Bridges decided that the uh, ceremony wasn't going to happen. Um, I personally watched some of these students go up to Chiefs Browns uh, right up to her face and call her you know, all kinds of names, um, cursing at her, as well as she had her young children with her uh, who were fearful of what's going on. Um, so the decision was made by the president that the ceremony wasn't going to go on and we all cleared the area and let the students basically take over and have whatever they wanted. So the, the students pretty much ran the show is how I feel. I just felt that that needed to get brought out because it's, I personally witnessed that um, on that day. Senator Albion. So are you aware of any discipline taken against those students? I am not. Uh, w would, do you think you would know if, if discipline had been taken? I think that if some discipline had happened later on, I, I wouldn't know. Um, I, I personally think that at the time it would have been appropriate for some immediate expulsions. <laughs> I, th I think most of us up here would agree with that. Um, I'd like to get an answer to that question. I'm not, I, th I th see the president is, oh, there you are, president. Okay, may maybe we'll have an opportunity for you to respond to that. Okay, sorry, go ahead and finish your comments. Um, that, that was my, my biggest thing. I just wanted to, to, to get that out there. Also, uh, I know that uh, when the, uh, the big group had had a uh, part of the protest later that the president had uh, told the chief to come to the, the uh, event unarmed, and I'm just questioning, as has been questioned, what, why should a president of a university tell a law enforcement official 
what they should be doing in, in that capacity. I, I would never in this day and age ever suggest a law enforcement officer go someplace unarmed or disarmed for any reason. So th thank you for your comments. What, what exactly did the Thurston County Sheriff's Office provide in the way of uh, helping with public safety up at Evergreen during the last few weeks? We've expended about uh, $12,000 um, in mutual aid cost. Um, last Thursday, we, we spent a little over uh, $10,000. We had about 31 uh, personnel on scene, um, along with the uh, numerous ones that the State Patrol provided. And uh, I think that it was because we had such a showing of force that we didn't have an issue there. I think that had, had we tried to go smaller at this event, that, that there could have been some really, uh, it could have gone bad. Could you uh, describe your relationship with the uh, State Patrol and also with uh, uh, Chief Brown? Um, we have a good working relationship with both. Um, the uh, Being called out to the college, we, we go on a, a mutual aid response. And so we are we are out this money. We aren't looking for reimbursement. I mean, we would love to get reimbursement, but at this point it's, it's not set up in a contract that way. Um, we have with the uh, State Patrol... They've been working some overtime shifts with troopers, and they've been taking the lead on that. And when they weren't able to fill some of the shifts, some of our deputies have been going out there and working overtime to, to fill those. All right, any other questions? Uh, Senator Darneal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to be clear about this, this show of uh, uniforms on campus all on one day, uh, you said it deterred potential other actions. I just want to be clear. Was your reason to be there because of students or faculty or administration, or was your reason to be there fear from outside agitators? No, we knew that there was going to be people from the outside coming in. We knew there was going to be students, and we wanted to make sure that everybody was safe and that it, they could do whatever they needed and that they were safe, and that's why there's so But many at that people. point, you did not expect an action by students at that point? You expected a possible action by outside agitators? I, I can't say to that. I, I wasn't part of that planning. As you talk about this from the global perspective of local law enforcement, how do you work with other local law enforcement in other college and university towns? Is there any kind of conference that you go to, any kind of information sharing, any kind of shared training that's unique to being the local law enforcement in a college or university town? Uh, every year, the uh, WASPIC conferences, they put on conferences about um, university policing. Um, I know some people have been to those things. I know it's mainly attended by the actual uh, law enforcement from the colleges. They're the ones that are tasked with the law enforcement, so we're kind of not, it's not our task to be there every day to, to handle law enforcement duties. Right, and I presume that you work here with the community colleges, South Sound, and with St. Martin's? Yes, when, as needed, and it's you know primarily the Lacey and Olympia Police Departments that would be the ones that would ask us to come in on anything like that. All right. All right, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, um, President Bridges, can you come back up for... Just wondered if you had any other perspective on the I do. the swearing-in ceremony for Chief Brown and what, what I happened do. there. I do. The students were disciplined. Uh, they were subjected to our student conduct code, and they were disciplined. Uh, that was something that we went through a series of uh, processes as this the Washington Administrative Code uh, requires of us, and they were processed through that and um, the, were disciplined. I don't know what the exact disciplines were, but I'd be happy to get that information to you. If you could get that to us. And did you consider rescheduling that uh, for your for your new chief? We did. We did reschedule it, and we had an event um, probably a month later that was uh, very secure and that was... Um, supportive of her appointment. She's been a terrific chief and uh, has helped us through some challenging challenging months. So we, we certainly want to welcome her, and we, we did that in a separate occasion. Um, there was a second issue. Oh, yes, I want to respond to the issue about the, uh, the gun, the handgun. Um, I made a mistake. In uh, the moment of uh, being surrounded by students, this, I wanted Chief Brown to come forward, and um, I was told by many individuals, faculty that, um, and staff, that uh, the students 
felt enormously uncomfortable with having an armed uh, law enforcement officer there. Um, I asked Chief Brown to come uh, without, her, without a firearm, and that was wrong, and I've apologized to her for it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, I appreciate that, your your candid comment there about that you made an error, and we, we all do, so appreciate that. Um, back to the earlier point, though, about the disruption of the ceremony. Mm -hmm. um, what do you believe was the disciplinary action taken? But let's talk about what the most serious action taken, to your knowledge. Um, three, I, I believe there was a number of quarters on, um, on probation uh, with restraints that if the um, student engaged in more conduct, they would be subject to a more severe discipline. So I'm sorry, does that mean they, they, they were on probation? No, they were not suspended. There was no action taken other than just to put them on probation? <laughs> Um, my understanding is that was what the action was. I have no uh, influence on the outcome of that decision. It is a very lengthy process, and uh, the process entails a series of reviews and appeals, and then that was the outcome of the of the sanction. I'd have to look at I'd have to look at more detail. Be happy to get you the information I have. What's the body that um, you know that, that, that processes a complaint like that and, and comes up with a discipline? There is a. a, a a, a process uh, guided by an assistant attorney general that uh, participates in this. So we have a conduct hearing board, and then we have a separate appeal board, and it is comprised of students, faculty, and staff. Okay. Did you agree with the ultimate uh, result? No. What would you have done if, if you had been able to have well, that? Let me qualify that. The, the process is the process that follows. Mm -hmm. So what I have in terms of my opinion really I understand. Can't, can't be invoked. Um, but you are the president of the institution, so I'm wondering if you agreed with the result. Well, given the process was followed appropriately, yeah, I do. But uh, if I were um, the sanctioning agent, which I'm not, I probably would have imposed, imposed a more severe sanction. Okay, thank you. You bet. Uh, Senator Angel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This uh, January situation is extremely, extremely troubling to me because it didn't appear that this was a protest. So if stu students took over and took a microphone away from whoever was doing this ceremony, what was their issue? I believe it was a protest. I think it was, I believe it was a protest uh, of um, uh, a law enforcement present on campus. Wow, and was there, uh, so did you have any knowledge of this ahead of time? I did not. Uh, what kind of security did you have on the ground for the situation? We were not expecting this protest and uh, we did not, we had a law, our law enforcement officers were present. All right, again, thank you uh, very much uh, for being here and taking uh, all the questions. We look forward to getting some of the information back that you've indicated you would uh, send us. Well, oh, certainly. Thank you, thank you very much. That'll conclude the work session. We do need to go into executive session and uh, uh, we can excuse our, our two representatives from the 22nd District, thank you. And I know you have your kennel to get back to, Senator Palumbo, so. I didn't know about a bill, I just know about some editorial appointments. Are we doing bills or just appointments? Uh, one bill. Okay. Let's uh, go ahead if we can get. Uh, I guess we can take a little break. Yeah, thank you. You bet. Right here for executive action. <laughs> Mr. Ford, could you uh, come forward? We, and if people wouldn't mind uh, either being quiet or exiting the hearing room, we have uh, some action to take on a, a gubernatorial appointment and on some legislation. So, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. 
Do you want to take up the gubernatorial? Yes. All right, Mr. Chair, I move that Tony Golick, uh, gubernatorial appointment number 9253, be reported for, with recommendation. All right, there's been a motion and second. Is there any discussion? I would only say that uh, Senator Darneal took advantage of the opportunity to send some questions to uh, Mr. Golick, and uh, he responded. And uh, so we appreciate that. Uh, I don't know if anybody else has any comments. If not, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Tony Golick, gubernatorial appointment number 9253, has received a confirmation recommendation subject to signatures. Mr. Chair, I move Senate Bill 5952. All right, we have 5952 before us. Uh, briefly, Shani, could you uh, explain? I know we had a hearing on the S draft, which was virtually the same as this. There have been a couple. Uh, changes and, and maybe you could uh, go over that. Uh, correct. Senator Patton, members of the committee, Shaney Bauer, um, staff counsel to this committee. Uh, you do have a proposed substitute. The, the bill that you heard, the, the S draft, is the same as 5952, and you have a proposed substitute for, to that bill on goldenrod paper. And uh, the changes were uh, basically as a result of the um, comments from the Department of Corrections and Rachel um, Seavers from Disability Rights Washington those changes. Um, it just makes a clarification. There were two references in there as to how often the committee is to meet the Ad Ombuds Advisory Council. And so it removes the um, statement that they meet at least once per year. So they are required to meet at least quarterly. It removes the obligation of the Ombuds to develop policies regarding public records requests and provisions relating to confidentiality. There was quite a bit of discussion about exempting um, the uh, Ombuds from public records requests. And so that those provisions are included uh, very similar to those that are in the uh, developmental disability Ombuds provisions. Um, and so investigative records of the Office of the Ombuds will be um, exempt from public records requests, as well as those documents from the Department of Corrections. So a person could not request from the Department of Corrections any and all documents provided to the Ombuds. Um, identifying information about complainants and witnesses is confidential, and of course that privilege does not apply when the Ombuds has knowledge of an alleged crime or becomes aware of a risk of imminent serious harm to any person. The uh, sub also clarifies that the ombuds may receive complaints regarding any allegation that may adversely affect the health, safety, welfare, and rights of inmates. That is an overarching um, statement as it relates to complaints to the ombuds. And then finally, increases the time period DOC has to respond to a written demand for records from the um, ombuds from 20 business days to 30 business days. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions of committee members about the substitute? Uh, Senator Peterson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Shani, uh, one question that has come up from the governor's office is whether there's an um, issue with the whistleblower section fitting within the title. And I guess I'd want to have your perspective on whether we should look at a title amendment when we get to the floor. Oh. Uh, well, there, uh, let's see, addressing early release here. There, there were statements in the, or there was some addressing of whistleblower um, provisions in the uh, early release error report. And so I think that that was the hook. We could certainly add that in if there was some concern. I think the earlier concerns were with um, all of the whistleblower corrections that um, were, came from the state auditor's office um, prior, and there wasn't a concern about this one, but um, if they're expressing concern now, we could certainly amend the title. I'd certainly be happy to work with Senator Peterson on that and, and see about possibly offering that on the floor if we if we need it. Um, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I, I just want to say, I guess for the record, uh, that I, I'm going to encourage folks to support the bill as it moves out of committee. I, I appreciate your commitment to work with us to, to uh, address any reasonable concerns that come up on the sub. Right. 
Thank you. I move the adoption of the proposed substitute on Golden Run. It's been moved and seconded that the proposed substitute be adopted. Any further discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. The proposed substitute is adopted. I move the substitute Senate Bill 5, 5952 be given to pass recommendation be sent to rules. And I will indicate that I did speak with uh, Senator Braun, and he indicated that since they'd already had this and dealt with it, that he preferred that it go to the to the Rules Committee. So it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Proposed substitute Senate Bill 5952 has received the due pass recommendation sent to rules subject to signature. We are adjourned. Uh, I assume we will have another meeting sometime, but who knows when. So anyway, thank you all for uh, your work today.